Hello, Facebook, YouTubes. Welcome to Deleted Scenes. Uh, we're in a new space, well, new to us. Um, we are, oh, and it's kind of dark here. Um, I wonder if, can I get back now? Yeah, well, okay. My face is going to be a little dark for this one because uh, I just got set up and we've started. So we're just going to go. Um, although you are a little low. Why don't I, careful, I'll uh, lift you up. Don't, don't fall. There you go. Okay. All right, so, um, <clears throat> wow, that's super off, and uh, live television, what can you say? Okay, so today we are continuing in our series on the Shema, and man, I'm still dark, but that's all right, and uh, we're going to be talking about um, love. So the word that we focused on, the word that we focused on for uh or the, the part of the Shema that we focused on this time was love the Lord your God with all your, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, okay? And we talked about heart, uh, levav. But today we're going to talk about love. Uh, let's do red. We got this new whiteboard and I'm super excited about it, so this is what we're going to do. Okay, so you've got a broken, uh, okay. Ahava. which we translate as love. And one of the things we talked about in the sermon is that it's, it's odd for us to command someone to love. That's not typically how we think of love because um, love is, is an emotion that you can't control. And so we don't think of it that way. We also talked about this other weird thing that happens in scripture where you have, uh, or in the Psalms, it talks about uh, hate. And the psalm writer will say, hey, God, aren't I doing what I'm supposed to? I, I hate your enemies. This, I hate them with a complete hatred. I loathe them. And there's this idea that hating, God's, that hating someone makes you virtuous. And so what we talked about in the sermon was the fact that ahava, love, is not just a relationship word. It's also a, in Hebrew, it is a... Um, diplomatic word. This is a word that they would use in treaties between nations, and they would use love and hate together in these treaties. That the idea was if, if a, because treaties were actually, since everything was pretty much monarchy, a treaty was an agreement between two people. And so they would sign these treaties in on individual terms. So it would be like me and that king over there. And we sign a treaty between the two of us. So I personally would would pledge to love my ally and to hate his enemies in which case these take on not emotional aspects but they take on aspects of uh keeping your word aspects of loyalty okay so loving someone means being loyal to them and hating their enemies means being disloyal to their enemies it means when people take sides i will be on your side and i will fight against them as if they were my enemies it doesn't mean I emotionally hate these people because that's something that we as Christians cannot do. But we can commit to being on God's side, to being loyal to him, and to oppose, to oppose uh, the forces that are opposing God. Okay, so that's Ahava is this, uh, is really about loyalty. Uh, or, in this, in this sense, it can be about loyalty, okay? And the thing about, the thing that, that got me thinking that I wanted to talk about today is that um, as I was doing this study, looking at love and loyalty and thinking, what does it mean for us to love God with our whole heart? Uh, and to be loyal to him, I realized that I was getting into territory that I had heard and thought of before. So I'm going to give you a, a book recommendation. I actually have not finished this book, but I have uh, read the main argument and, and I have heard the argument made in other places as well. I think it's a really interesting book to read because it, pro it has a very thought-provoking idea. It's called Salvation by Allegiance Alone. 
Now, you are familiar, perhaps, with the phrases saved by grace alone, saved by faith alone. And uh, those are, those are um, tenets of faith for Protestants. Uh, and you know they're important because we often say them in Latin. So sola gracia is grace alone, and sola fides is by faith alone. Or sola fide, sorry, sola, sola fide. And now here's the interesting thing. Neither of those phrases actually occur anywhere in Scripture, except there's one place where it says you are not saved by faith alone. It's the only place where the words faith alone come into Scripture. But faith is, uh, Paul talks about how we are saved by our faith. Um, we are saved by grace through faith. And one of the big things that we debate as Protestants is what does it mean to be saved by faith? What does my faith mean? There have been whole schisms and debates and arguments about what it means to be saved by faith uh, as opposed to it's saved by, you're saved by faith, which we tend to think of saved by what you believe. And they're saved by grace, saved by the, or, sorry, <laughs> they're saved by faith, saved by what you believe. And they're saved by works, saved by what you do. And work salvation doesn't work. Work salvation is bad, uh, but you can be saved by what you believe. And so the, <clears throat> in, so we have faith over here. And you heard me say sola fide. Uh, by faith alone. Wow, bad reflection. Okay, so by faith alone, sola fide. Now, so the argument in this book, Salvation by Allegiance Alone, is that we have misunderstood this word. Okay, basically that Protestants, uh, many Protestants, not all Protestants, but and not all the time, but uh, when we start arguing about faith being simply a belief, that all you have to do is believe certain facts about God uh, or believe certain facts about Jesus, that we're misusing the word faith. Because faith can mean the things you believe, the facts that you believe are true. Okay, It can refer to belief. However, the way it's used in the New Testament it actually, or it, it has more meanings, and the way it's used in the New Testament actually points towards a different meaning. You may recognize this sound, fide, uh, as parts, uh, as, you know, this has found its way into English words, like, fidelity, right? Fidelity is... Uh, High fidelity in sound is, is really accurate sound reproduction, or fidelity in a marriage is being faithful to your spouse. So faith can mean belief. But faith can also mean faithfulness. And this makes a lot more sense when we read the New Testament, partly because we are not just saved through faith, but we are saved in some sense by the faith of Jesus. And Jesus' virtue wasn't simply in the fact that he believed facts about God, right? James says even the demons believe in one God. Jesus' virtue was his faithfulness to God. The fact that he, he obeyed God, that he was loyal to God. And so what we find is that this idea of faith is also pointing towards this core concept of loyalty. That when scripture talks about faithfulness, talks about faith, it's really talking about being loyal. So you're not faithful, you're not saved by faith in terms of, um, well, I just believe good things are going to happen. I believe these facts. Faith is choosing a side. It's choosing to be loyal to God. And it's, it's not, it's, it's not a, uh, you, uh, it's the stereotype that, that always gets thrown around. As soon as you start, pushing away from faith as belief is, oh, well, you're talking about works righteousness. You have to earn your place. And that's not what we're getting into. But what we're talking about is the fact that uh, 
having, uh, having faith in God means being faithful to God. It means actually making an investment in the kingdom. It means actually putting your life in God's hands, committing yourself to God. It's the same essential idea at the core as loving God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, or heart, soul, and strength, is that you're, you're giving yourself to God. You invest yourself in God. It doesn't mean that you have to have something uh, worth a certain amount to give God, but you have to give God what you are. Whatever you are has to be given over to God. And so this idea that I, I struggled growing up with this idea that, well, I said the prayer, so I'm saved, but I don't feel saved. I don't feel like I'm getting any better. And it, it, I wasn't actually all that impressed with this idea that I could be saved from some future thing, but it wasn't actually going to change me here and now. And what I have found is that um, this, this understanding of Scripture is far more meaningful and, and more accurate to Scripture uh, this understanding that we are called to be faithful to God. So this this is why it makes sense for Jesus to be to say that this idea of this command to love is at the very center of the Old Testament. It's the path to the New Testament, and it is the way to eternal life. Because loving God with all your heart, soul, and strength is the same as being faithful to God. It's all this idea of loyalty. So what that means is that it matters which side we choose to be on. Not just the lip service that we pay, but the side that we pick. When the chips are down, when, when, when the battle lines are drawn, which side are you going to be on? And it's interesting that when you get into the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation people tend to think is all about laying out timelines and punishments and judgments and, and all of that. But really, the point of the book of Revelation is to challenge the church to pick a side because the church, or because the book lays out some of the things, the types of things that are going to be happening to the church. And it essentially says the people who will triumph are the ones who are loyal to God, the ones who witness faithfully, the ones who are willing to face opposition. And so, all throughout Scripture, whether you're looking at the Old Testament's commands to love God or the New Testament uh, notion of or uh, doctrine of salvation through faith or the visions of revelation about these showdowns between uh, between the forces of evil and the lamb and his people. It's all talking about loyalty. So when you read scripture, what you ought to come away with is a challenge to pick a side, to decide who you're going to be loyal to. When the sides are picked, are you who are you going to love and who are you going to hate? Because in the in the Old Testament sense, not in the emotional sense, but in the Old Testament sense, you have to love one side and you have to hate the other. You have to join one side and oppose the other. You have to uh, choose God's way or you have to choose the way that opposes God. And that choice is where everything depends. So that's my little illustration using our new whiteboard. Uh, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to chime in or to send them to our Facebook page um, or uh, come into church on Sunday. Uh, we'll be continuing with loving the Lord with all of your soul or your nefesh, which will be a really surprising translation when you understand what that word means. And we'll have a discussion on uh, another one of these videos next Monday. So I hope to see you there. Thanks so much. God bless.